an economy narrowly from the standpoint of what are the different ways that income comes into a household? That's this community income challenge. Wages is one. That means you go to work for somebody, they pay you some money, and that way you can go buy some food. What's another one? Rent. What does that mean? You can get paid for the use of your assets. When you get paid for the use of your labor, that's wages. But when you get paid for the use of other assets, it's rent. And that can either be a bunch of money you have on Wall Street or in some high interest bearing account, or it can be the money you get paid for the use of, of a room you got upstairs, which is an asset that you own. So rent income is very much connected with ownership. So before you can get some rent, you got to own something, okay? Small commodity production, what is that? Simple commodity production. Suppose somebody buys a pack of cigarettes and engages in labor on it, which is to break them up into single cigarettes and go out and market these single cigarettes. Is he engaged in economic activity? Of course. Okay, and who gets the product, the profit that comes from that? Who's paid by that? No, I mean, I'm yeah, the that yeah, that, yeah. yeah, so the person who's doing that work is actually engaged in a simple commodity production. What are some other examples of that that happen in some of the neighborhoods we, we live in? Food banks, selling plates. Selling plates of food, absolutely. What else? Bootleg CDs and DVDs, absolutely. Selling water on the corner? Huh? Selling water on the corner. Selling water on the corner. Doing Somebody packages it as a single from the... Uh, Doing hair. Doing hair. All of these things where you use your labor to directly produce something for somebody else and they pay you for it, you don't have a capitalist involved in that situation taking your surplus off of it. You're engaged in simple commodity production. But what is it we know about simple commodity production in this country? It, most of it's illegal. Yeah. Now, listen, I mean, think how crazy that is. So, Eric Garner, New York, selling Lucy, dead. Uh, uh, what's my man's name down in Baton Rouge? Selling, uh, uh, Alton Sterling. Yeah, Alton Sterling. Dead. Drug dealers. Dead. Drug dealers goes out and buys a block of marijuana, breaks it up into packaging for individual sale, distributes it to a network of people he has up. That's simple commodity production. It's illegal. No. So, <laughs> you know, Are you in Colorado? <laughs> now, here's a note. What's a transfer payment? Western Union? Take, taking money from one person and giving it to somebody else. Sort of, yeah. In, 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 in a very broad way, it is. So transfer payments are the money that goes into a community. It can come in through an insurance settlement. It can come in through a government action. The government taxes you on something and then pays you it. It can come in as a welfare check. It can come in as a, as a payoff from some rich uncle who died and left you something. These are just trans. They don't produce any new value. They just transfer it from one place to the other. Um, and then, you know, the small business owners are basically in, in, engaged in, in small commodity production. Even if they have a barber shop or a beauty parlor or a recording studio or, or make beats and sell them. Barber shop, beauty shop, recording studio, makes beats and sell them cutting grass. So there are a few things that are, are legal. Now, one of the things that struck me when I was putting this list together was, in my neighborhood, I know a lot of communities where the bulk of the household income coming to those communities does not come from wages. It comes from transfer payments and, and, and small commodity production. It comes from drug trafficking and welfare checks. <laughs> Do any of y'all live in a neighborhood where, where, where there are poor neighborhoods around you? Yes. Now, there are other neighborhoods where the bulk of the money coming into them comes in through wages, right? Oh, I left out a category, subsistence. What do y'all think is subsistence income? It would be growing your own food. What are some other subsistence activities? One other thing that happens in subsistence activity is it's never monetized. You grow your own food, you bring it in the house, you eat it. You don't ever actually convert it into dollars. Some people have no idea what the dollar value of their garden is. They don't even care. You could, you know, consider some types of crime to be subsistence activity, whether it's, you know, you're robbing somebody in order to feed yourself, 
or you know, you're dealing drugs because that's the only economic activity that's available to you. That's a subsistence crime. Well, I'm not talking. Th this is a, a particular category of things that I'm using in a certain way, and 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 for for those kinds of things, uh, that small commodity production where you are, are dealing drugs to make a living. I don't want to count that as subsistence because I think it's something very important about subsistence income in communities that is worth thinking about, which is that up until recently, most of the people in the world lived in communities that were dominated by subsistence <coughs> income, which is to say that things were not monetized, but you produce them directly for your use of them. Hunting. Huh? Hunting. Hunting is a, certainly a subsistence oh, income, yeah. a, a subsistence activity. Hunting, growing your own garden. How about cooking dinner in your kitchen? Yeah. Yeah. Sewing your own Watching clothes. Your, this is so important. Because I'm going to say something about women here in a second. All of the things that you do that produce extra value, but it never gets monetized, and that you would otherwise have to pay for, but you don't because you get it, is part of the subsistence income. So, ironing your children's clothes is subsistence activity. Cooking dinner. In cooking dinner, it is subsistence economic activity. You go out, you buy raw material. You buy raw, raw meat, raw vegetables at a store. You bring them home. You engage in labor on it. You never convert it into money. You don't even calculate the value of it once you have bought it. You feed your family. You could, in order to feed your family the same way, you could conceivably go out to a restaurant and pay a much larger. So you could actually calculate the money value of the fact that you cook at home or that you iron at home or that you wash your own clothes. Uh, you could calculate it, but it never gets monetized. You know, and if you think about it, so, so this wage system is only one of five different things that you can do that produce, that bring household income. And quite frankly, if you want to make sure that you preserve the livelihood of a household, you can increase the wages in it, but if you decrease some of those other things, the quality of life can go down. So here we are spending most of our time talking about 5 to 15 and living wage and all that. And we're not paying attention to the fact that there are five different types of household income. Wages are being one of them. And so that even if you did that and you would cut off all the transfer payments, which is what happens with these workfare programs, the government offers to cut out transfer payments, welfare checks, in order to, to tell you that more of you need to go and have a wage income. But it can easily lower the quality of life in the community because part of the money coming in the community was coming from transfer payments. Mm -hmm. Or you can make it make even more of these uh, um, simple commodity production things illegal and use this as a way of driving down the living standard in the neighborhood. I know neighborhoods literally. But if you look at the cars they drive and the way people are living, you know good and well, and the fact that it's 56% unemployment in that neighborhood, you know that wages are not the main way that money is coming to that neighborhood. This is not. Yes. I was just thinking of what you're saying about the transfer payments. If people are cutting out welfare, because I think a lot of people are working wages who buy the uh, food stamps. Yeah. Who are basically making a better quality of life for their home. So if you're cutting out the food stamps, you might cut out somebody's quality of their life for their You could even, yeah, you could even cut that out. Certainly can. With the subsistence income, I just want to your quality of life, we increase our household wages, but all the subsistence stuff, you know, the child care, I mean, I have a four-year-old son, all, the, all of those things, the cooking at home, everything, it, it's like it didn't balance out, not in monetizing that or not including it, yeah. it really alters your quality of life, Absolutely. and they need to be done, you know, you know, it's, it's a weird thing, because, you know, I worked more, but then I had to have child care, which made things go up and up, and you know, it's just the subsistence piece is a really big, I'm not trying to conceptualize what that does to a household and to a family, and how does the evil, how does that work against wages, or how does that? Well, one of the things I want to offer, come from a lot of people over here, is that the development of capitalism was an attack on subsistence. Yeah. Because nobody will leave and go work inside a factory for a wage knowing that they not get full value for, for what it is they produce except that you have so damaged their subsistence level of, of living that they have a hard time doing it. 
So what are some of the ways that worldwide subsistence is being attacked? <laughs> a little bit. But what's a big thing that goes on worldwide? Fracking. Fracking is certainly an attack on the, 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 the environment. Deforestation. Yeah. He's saying enclosure, and, and by that, yeah. it's stealing people's land. And, and, and you know, here at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, we know that people are paying a lot of attention to the fact that there, these land grabs have taken place. And in the course of a land grab, people are no longer able to do for themselves on the basis of the subsistence. And they are forced into the money economy. Now, a slick thing about international political economy stuff is that actually capital would like for some amount of a subsistence economy to remain. You know why? Because it means they can pay lower wages. You know, where their responsibility to keep people from starving to death, or else they won't have anybody come work in the factory. But if you can keep people from starving to death by paying low wages because there is a reasonably robust subsistence economy still in existence. So when these companies move around the world, we end up talking about they're paying starvation wages over there. Well, that would be true if people got all their income from their wages. But people aren't getting all their income from their wages. People are still growing food. People are still uh, engaged in simple production. People are engaged in a lot of other things. You cannot live on $30 a year in U.S. money. And so we're giving those figures and talking about how sorry we should feel for somebody. But realize people are not living on that. People are living because of a fairly robust subsistence economy still intact. People are living because they're still engaged in some level of, of simple commodity, petty commodity production. And typically in other parts of the world, there are not a lot of transfer payments because governments don't tax and give money away. But certainly subsistence and, uh, and small production are things that happen, and it's on the basis of that that they'll move the factories to Bangladesh or China or someplace else. They don't do it on the basis of being able to pay money so little money that people would starve. Then they would starve. You said that causes a downward pressure. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Where there is no subs where there is no healthy subsistence income. You know, where subsistence is weakened here, and by them chasing around the world for where subsistence is stronger, they can still get, and they'll do it by forcing you to buy some stuff that you can only pay with cash money. iPhones. Well, it would be in some places it would be communication devices. In other places it is paying taxes that are required, or the government comes after you with a gun and threatens to take your land and stuff. Other things that have, where you have to pay some cash money it's what forces people into factories. That's true in Mexico, that's true in India, that's true in China, that's true around the world. And where the subsistence income is healthier than it, subsistence economy is healthier than it is here, people are able to live on lower wages because you don't, you're not dependent on you know, wages to eat. But let's back up. I want to say something about women. Who do you think is at the core of subsistence in this country? It's like no question about it. This is this is, and and so given that it's, it's not measured in terms of the economic value of it because it never got monetized, we ignore a substantial part of what it is that's still going on in terms of the role that women play, often cooking the food, ironing the clothes, raising the children. The other thing, if you talk about this internal labor project, uh, process, which is producing children, and it has to match with an external labor process that produces food, who is at the core of producing children? Amen. Oh, yeah. So now all of a sudden we have a way of looking at the economy. <laughs> but the most important people in it are women. I love it. <laughs> because I think it's honest. I think it is an honest way of thinking about the economy and the role that women play in it. And it's nothing about we got to find a way to get women into the workforce. That gets them into the wage system to produce wages. And they, they should and can often and sometimes will, but there's some who don't for reasons of their own. And, and all of that's fine because a, a healthy economy has to produce people and it has to produce food and stuff. And so the folk who are producing the people need to be taken care of by the folks who are producing the food and stuff and getting paid a wage or getting paid other access to money coming into the household. Unless you're homeless, you don't have a household, and then we have to think about social mechanisms to take care of and make sure that everybody there is okay. Uh, 
one thing it takes is labor. And labor is human energy. It's human energy that is produced by burning up food in a process that produces humans. One thing, one peculiarity about human energy labor is that you can't separate it from the humans that it is contained in. So when a capitalist buys your human energy, he's not buying you. Under slavery, he bought you. But under capitalism, he doesn't buy you. He buys your human energy. But you have to bring it with you to work. You can't send it. I say, go on over there and work for me. I'm going to hang here in the house. So you are there with me. Then your human energy is used up. At which point, how do you know when it's used up? There you go. You get time. And you have to go back into the community and have it replenished with this food that is bought from the other process, right? What is another uh, um, key resource for an economy to work? Land. And I call land and labor sacred. That's because they were here before we were. Well, land was here before we, where we were. Uh, it replenishes itself. It is the basis of all of this other economic stuff we're talking about. Labor is sacred because it embodies the human, and it is for the purpose of humanity that all of this activity is carried out. On the other hand, there's some other things that I think I was being instrumental. And one is capital. Does anyone know a quick, short definition of capital? Stored labor. Huh? Accumulation of labor. It, it, it comes from an accumulation of labor, but it's a very particular kind of, of, of uh, often money or equipment or something. Yeah, it's like, it's like a unit of capacity to produce a surplus value. It is. It, it is indeed that as well. What he described, I think, is more principal than capital is, is that stored money. Well, <laughs> One of the people that did as much as anybody else for helping develop an understanding of capital and capitalism in the world is yeah, Karl Marx. Oh, yeah. And he's, he's, he, said, he said that money used to buy things is just money. It's, you know, you, you use some money to buy some food, that's just money. You use some money to buy a car, that's just money. He said, on the other hand, money that you use to buy something that then will end up producing more money that is greater than the amount of money that you started with, that's capital. So the formula he writes for it is M, money, to C, which is commodities, back to M prime, which is a larger amount of money than before. So a lot of people I've heard use phrases like gift capital and all kind of things to talk about money in all kinds of which ways. But I think it's really useful to think about, let's just narrow this down to the money that is used to make more money. And it goes through that cycle. Now the normal economic cycle before capitalism came to dominate the world was different. It was commodity, money, commodity. Which is to say, you make something, you sell it, then you use the money you, you, you sell it for to buy something else that you want. So it ends with you having something that you want, a use value. You can't use up with so much stuff, right? So this is a, a finite process where you engage in, in a capital, I'm sorry, commodity, money, commodity. That's a reasonable and it's elegant and lightweight on the earth. The process of money, commodity, money has no end. It can grow infinitely. You know what one is added to a great big amount? It's a great big amount plus one. <laughs> And if you double it, it's a great big amount plus one times two. And you can keep on going. And there's no stop to that. The problem is that the earth itself, the sacred thing that we end up generating this stuff from, is finite. Now, it's finite, but it's really big. So it would have been easy for people at one time to almost think of the earth as though it were infinite. But it's not. And right now, we're coming to the edge of its carrying capacity. That means the ability of it to, without doing further dam damage to the children yet to be born, to keep alive those of us who are using it. So water is getting polluted, air is getting poisoned, uh, land is getting worn out, land grabs are continuing, so the Koreans and the Chinese are coming over to Africa and buying up thousands of acres of land in Mali, in Mozambique, 
uh, in Tanzania and other places because they know they've worn out a lot of the land close to because of the high population density that they have. They're wearing out land. They're grabbing other land. Once grabbed, some of this land can be very, very difficult to ever get back. <laughs> so again, this sacred land and this sacred labor is being dissipated by capital, which ought to be instrumental. By instrumental, I mean capital ought to help us be able to do things we want to do. So, if I am trying to make a Nissan automobile, I can make a Nissan automobile much faster if I have a plant full of robots, like the guy in Canton, Mississippi. It's still got 2,000 people working there, but I will assure you that there are a bunch of robots in there that are still programmed by humans, that are still repaired by humans, so don't naively think that we've reached the end of human labor because robots are going to build robots and they're going to do everything. That's a science fiction dream. That, that would be a world I wouldn't even want to live in. I've seen the Terminator. We do not want that. I don't want to live in a world where robots build robots. Yeah. <laughs> that would be so ugly. Yeah. But, but they don't. Slow down. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 get, I get excited. They do it in mind, you know. Oh, yes. No, I was just going to say, this capital that ought to be instrumental, that ought to be used as a tool to help us do things that satisfies something in that middle column, instead is used as the end all and be all of economic activity, because under the capitalist system and the domination of capital, the aim is to ever increase capital. They will tell you, like, you know, increase in profit. That's the only reason for business activity. I was just going to back up back to labor and add that, um, you know, when human energy is being depleted um, within the commodity economy, that another um, gender <laughs> activity that's not, again, being calculated is love or emotional labor, because um, food is not enough to replenish someone back into that economy, so it's kind of the right. dream that happens yeah. in there. Yeah. And so again, yeah. women oftentimes are the ones who are taxed with that emotional labor. Emotional labor and the nurturing of All right, Helen. Making people's life worth living. And again, one of the things to think about is that when we're talking about the reproduction of a community, we have to mean it's full reproduction so that it is back to where it is able to do all of the things that it could do beforehand, which is that nurturing wholesome relationships exist between people, where people are educated into the life of the community, where people know the history and the culture of the community, and it's consequently, and all of this is that, and so that the love stuff you're talking about is very much a part of that. Absolutely. Elders too. Yeah. just old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay, systems. Capital is instrumental. What about systems? Think about rules and tools. Rules, rules and, tools. and tools. Those ought to be instrumental. You know why? Because we make them. <coughs> humans get a chance to make rules, and humans get a chance to make tools. So why would humans not make the rules and the tools to enhance human life and our ability to do what's in that middle column? But I think what we see is that both rules and tools are often made to enhance capital, which ought to be instrumental, and it's not sacred, except capitalists think it's sacred. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. And the rules and the tools <laughs> that they set up are sometimes used to facilitate capital expanding rather than meet up with the food, clothing, shelter, security, education, education, art, health, transit, communication, communication, life of meaning, all of that stuff. Okay? So that's rules and tools. And so sometimes we need to think about, we got to change the rules. If someone says you can't do that, it's like, why? Because that's the rule. They're like, well, somebody made that rule. Let's figure out what kind of power we need to put together so we can change that. What kind of power do we need to put together so we can change that rule? Because we made that rule. What are we going to do about these tools? We have tools that are terrible tools. What kind of power do we need to put together to make different tools that are more compassionate and fitting within our needs, values, passions, and desires. Mm -hmm. So, above that is a section that's on here, it's called Key Activities. The first one I have is Development, Production, Storage, Distribution, 
marketing, trade, consumption, waste transfer, waste storage, and waste disposal. <laughs> that list covers a whole bunch of what, people, what goes on in the money economy. <coughs> a developer has an idea to make access to some capital. He will then put together some productive facility. He will hire wage labor. They'll produce something. After they produce it, they will store it somewhere. Then there's a distribution firm that will spread the distribution out. If it's stored on a steel robot warehouse, they'll store it out in a smaller warehouse that are closer to the individual store. There's somebody who does a marketing campaign, so the stuff is on television. Then there's trade that goes on when someone walks into a store and actually gets to buy it. Then they consume it after they bought it. They take it home and consume it. Then after it's consumed, there's waste. What's the waste that comes from a flat screen TV? The big clumsy cardboard box that nobody needs for nothing. But we, we produce them, we have to get rid of them. Um, so waste transfer, you got to take it out of your house, take it somewhere. It typically gets stored for a while. Then it's disposed of. Uh, either get buried in the ground and hope that 300 years from now it will have rotted and go into something else. Or it'll get burned in an incinerator, which is poisoning the air around you. Or it will go into composting, which is actually one of the better things that you could do, where it's used as organic material that helps with the production of food again. But that whole list, that development, and the development thing is so important because somebody initiates this process that goes through all of those phases. And that person is typically a developer. And what it ends up happening is they end up typically owning it. The first part of it, once it gets to consumer con consumption and waste and stuff, they let anybody own that. They don't care what you do with your, your cardboard box. But the other part of it, they're getting all the benefits off of the production and stuff. So all the new value that is created by this human energy belongs to the developer. And he'll either cash out and then go somewhere and develop something else with this, leverage the money somewhere to, to, to do a bigger investment. So that's what, what uh, the developers are doing. The production, and the production itself, you're engaging in an economic activity where profits are made so that profitable production things, some of us are engaged directly in production and we need to think about how the inputs into the production have to be uh, reasonable enough for us to produce what we're trying to produce and sell it at a value that covers all of the inputs, pays all of the labor, and leaves something left over for the sustainability of the business. That's whether it's a cooperative or if it's a capitalist enterprise. If it's a capitalist enterprise, what is left over after you pay for everything you need to do is elevated as the most important reason that the business exists. Think about how dumb that is. You've made something that people needed. You've sold it. You paid for all of the inputs into it, all of the raw material. You paid for all of the labor that it took to do it. You paid all of the taxes. You've even paid for your management skills. You've even paid for the intellectual property rights for the patent you might have used to do it. You paid for everything. And once you've paid for all of that, there's still some money left over out of the revenues from selling it. And that's what you get to keep, and it's called net profit. And that amount of profit is the only reason for the business existence. It's the money you have left over after you spent all of the money you needed to spend. It's kind of whack. I mean, think about it. It's like, what's the purpose of my business? Purpose to have something left over after I've done everything I need to do, and then I'm, I'm gonna maximize the leftover part. That's uh, kind of weird. Okay. Um, so another key economic activity is rulemaking. How does rulemaking happen in a community? Educational institutions. Uh, uh, golden rule. Um. Uh, what does I mean? Do any of y'all live in communities where the city council passes ordinances and laws? Yeah. Are those rules? Y'all yeah. live in states where the state legislature passes rules? HB2 in North Carolina, some else different rules? Yeah. Aren't y'all living in places where the Constitution exists as a great big gigantic set of rules about private property relations and all of that? So typically rulemaking, and I'm not saying it's exclusively and only this, but the biggest part of rulemaking is what government entities do. They make rules, and so they make laws. Now, we call this nominally a democracy. What does that mean about our potential influence on rulemaking? 
Have we ever felt like somehow you just don't have as much influence over the rule making as rich people do? Now, it's got to be more poor people than rich people, right? Yeah. Why is it all the rules seem like they're made for rich people and they're more of us? And this is a democracy. It's the golden rule. We got representative government, and what does that end up? Mean? What does that concretely mean to keep us from being able to make any rules? We're not sitting at the table. Huh? We're not sitting at the table. We're not sitting at the table. Yes. Because it takes money to be a representative. It yeah. takes money to be a representative. If there was one phrase I would want to use to describe a capitalist system, I would say it is the domination of capital, which means that capital gives you an inordinate advantage in all of the rule making and all of the tool making because you can afford the tools. I mean, you can buy the robots for the new side. But all of the rule making too. So there's a process in a representative government that you're talking about where, uh, where you have to vet, well first of all, democracy doesn't scale very well. You know what I mean by that? Like if we had to have a democratic process with the people in this room, it wouldn't be that hard for us to talk to each other, get to know each other well enough to decide who it was we thought would represent our interests and, and do something. We have millions of people, you know how hard that is? So we end up being dependent on mass media and other kinds of things, but each one of them is dominated by money. So in order to be vetted, to be on the mass media, to tell people what you want to do, you have to have huge amounts of money, which means that virtually none of the people who would really represent our interests are likely to get into a position of being able to do so. And if it happens, it would be such a rare event that they would be swallowed up in the overwhelming majority of the people there who are representing the interests of huge amounts of money. So we're living under the domination of capital. And it, it, it distorts and confuses everything. I don't like capital. Uh, so rulemaking, tool making. What are some of the kind of tools we can think about? That are bad? Well, bad ones, good ones, too, you know. Computers. A computer is a tool. That's right. A hammer, somebody said, is a tool. I heard, I tried it. Can you use the master's tools to tear down the master's house? Well, you can. I think you can. I think the challenge is using the master's tools to tear down the house while you live in it. I think that's where people are challenged. <laughs> like, I live up in this sucker too, so maybe I don't really want to. <laughs> maybe I don't really want to tear it down. Maybe we just adjust the, maybe we change the height of the windows or something. You know, <laughs> we just open a window and let the breeze flow through. We don't want to tear it down. Now. But, but the tools, tools are multi-purpose. I can, I can turn a screw with a hammer if I want to. I can drive a nail with a screwdriver or a wrench. I've done it before. I, I will abuse some tools. So in other words, a tool can be used or it can be misused. Tools don't have to be used for what they were designed to be used for. So maybe what Audre Lorde was talking about is you can't tear down the master's house with the master's tools as he intended for them to be used. So that's probably true. But that you can't use those tools. We are some creative folks. My notion is that as we gain access to tools, we will be able to find ways to utilize those tools in our own interest when we have access to them. But tools and tool making is a really important part of the economic life of a community. I have something now you call social mitigation and conflict resolution. Why is that an important economic activity in a community? Yeah. So people will find a reason to argue with each other. And if there was no process for resolving the disagreements that people have, it could get to be really, really ugly. And so there's a whole process. And so typically what we have for social mitigation and conflict resolution is a terribly imperfect system. And we call it, we call it the justice system. Well, we make more sense to call it the injustice system. But, uh, but that's, that's a process for that. And again, it's part of the life of a community. Um, Making more people nourishing, caring, and education. That's back to um, the work that women are at the center of. Now, women don't do all of the nourishing and caring and educating, but they're the core of it. They're the center of it. Uh, for however other many people participated in it, women have for a long time, and probably for some time to come, will be at the core of it. 
And that doesn't have to be anything that anyone is trying to change. Um, because it is such a, a natural part of the necessity of life and community. So that, that happens. We just have to make sure that it is valued like participation in the wage system is valued. The idea that you're not going to value that and you're only going to value participate, participation in an exploitive wage system, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. We should be very careful about that. The other thing, taking responsibility. How do we take responsibility? Who do we have to take responsibility for? We have to take responsibility for ourselves. We have, to, we have to, for elders who can't always take care of themselves, we have to take responsibility for the children yet to be born. We have to take responsibility for the homeless. We have to take responsibility for the infirm. And it's an important part of what we're doing, and we set up special mechanisms to do it. Some of them are monetized, some of them are not. And the last thing is maintenance and repair. And you know why I put maintenance and repair as a key activity? Because everything we do wears out. I mean, we should not have the idea that anything is permanent. Things are used and they are consumed in the process that they use. Some things are consumed very, very slowly over a long period of time. Some things are consumed quickly. But everything is ultimately used up. Either has to be repaired or recycled and somehow made available. And certainly you don't want it to just pile up. Uh, on the key partnerships, I have some stuff that's really not all that interesting to me. But sometimes we end up having to work in this world which is banking, finance, government, engineers and scientists, academia, we are kind of knowledge producers and packagers, international traders, philanthropy, and we can make that list longer. This is a list of kind of all the people who will tell you that they're really, really important. <laughs> all right. And you know, they kind of are, um, but unless they have to do with making rules, making tools, making food, then their importance is yeah. They're, they're no more important than, than many of the other people we've already described on here. But they will tell you that these are, that they're just the most important thing in the world. At the bottom, there's something I think is really, really um, interesting. What is consumed and what then remains? Well, food is consumed, and the remnant of food after it's consumed is poop. All right? Energy is consumed. And the result of energy after it's consumed, this is different from fuel consumption. I want to make a slight difference. After energy is consumed, <coughs> we end up producing something called entropy, which is a very slow process, not terribly interesting. The physics of it basically means we can't build perpetual motion machines. Most of us have stopped trying. Some of us keep doing it. But every time somebody tells us they have a perpetual motion machine, I realize that you cannot avoid the danger of entropy, the way energy is degraded, and so it won't work. I don't even need to know the details of one more. Fuel is consumed and it produces ash and carbon dioxide, right? Where do we have big ash problems? Near coal plants. Anybody here? Yeah, exactly right. Anybody hear about uh, Duke Power in North Carolina? Yes. And these coal ash spills and all that uh, stuff going on in Tennessee around these coal plants and these coal. I mean, so ash is, so fuel is used to produce energy. And fuel has a remnant, which is ash, and something has to happen to it, all right? That could be an economic activity. Similarly, CO2 is produced from burning any carbon fuel. It's in the atmosphere. It's about to make us all live underwater when the, when the coastlines all flood, and the climate changes, and these super storms wipe out huge numbers of people. The other thing is people get consumed in the course of, uh, of producing stuff. And what is the remnant from that? Dead bodies. Now, no one thinks about dead bodies as, as an economic category, unless you are a mortician. <laughs> Morticians realize what? Just like people eat in every community, people die in every community. So if you want to know a business, you can definitely have a, a stake in a community open a funeral home. I mean, yes. So we see the dying business? <laughs> Go ahead. Where does, where does culture fit into this framework? A lot of rules and about tools consumption. Um, it was in the middle part where we're talking about the needs and values and desires. It's like creating culture and transmitting it is a part of making us the people that we are, the reproducible people that actually have values and are able to live with each other. It's incredibly important. But I, I put it as one of the needs, values, passions, and desires to have a healthy cultural life. 
and it's really important, and certainly there's economic activity around cultural life, because a lot of young people in our community, they're producing culture all the time. They're making beats, they're doing this hip-hop stuff. Sony and Viacom have figured out how to make huge amounts of money off of them. If we had a way to keep the wealth off of the cultural production of our young people in our community, you think we didn't have access to some, to some money that would help expand the economic lives in our community? Just an idea. I have a question. Yes. So media consumption, right? I know that we're not talking about it now. I guess being in media, I think about how we watch culture, you know, it indoctrinates us. We talk about the education system, but the biggest way that we get indoctrinated into things is to like visually watch them. So look at, look at who owns media outlets and how they want to shift culture because uh, in order to control this process in some some way, I think we don't pay enough attention to literal, you know, propaganda and um, the promotion of changing our culture in some way. I mean, I've heard people say things like the breakdown of family or the breakdown of, you know, why um, marriage or just all these different things. But it has cultural ramifications, you know, relative to the people that you said are. Um, doing that subsistence living, or what is it, you know, or somehow we're not paying attention to uh, the unintentional passive, uh, uh, you know, indoctrination that we're getting through our media. We're, we're not paying attention to that, and we're allowing ourselves to be altered so that we're not, you know, this process, is, and it's impacting this process, and I don't think we pay attention to that. I agree. I agree. And, you know, it's weird because... Again, under the domination of capital, where the end all and be all is to increase the capital, you end up at the end of a process. So they'll make media products, so they can make uh, they can make Deadpool the movie, or they can make um, Luke Cage and stuff. As long as they make more money after having made it than they made, you know, sometimes the content of those things will be more palatable and tolerable than others. The people who are making it grew up in a world where they think that there's some of these key partners who are producers of knowledge and stuff, and they kind of looking for ways to justify the existing structure of the society as it is, because it serves them well. So I don't think that they're necessarily engaged in a conspiracy to confuse us. They're engaged in a conspiracy to make a bunch of money. In the course of that, their fundamental ideology that they're approaching it with is one that would be confusing, because it is the ideology of, this thing ain't so bad. You know, this, this is kind of cool, and we want to figure out how to make a bunch of money. Some people may be directly engaged in, in, um, in trying to deliberately confuse us. But what I'm saying is, even if they didn't, even if we could never prove anybody is trying to mis miseducate you in that way, they would still do the same thing that looks like what it's doing, because they come from a worldview that has Columbus being a hero. Once you can think of Columbus as a hero, you can imagine damn near anything, <laughs> right? And so, so I mean, they have for years made this the way. This is how they see the world, and then they try and make a bunch of money. And so they'll make things that are more progressive, less progressive, and all that. But that's their worldview that grows out of their material conditions of life. Um, there's just two more things on here I want to go, and then we're gonna have. A, oh yes. Eh, yo tenía una pregunta eh, muy relacionada con la pregunta de dónde cabe la cultura dentro de esa de pensarnos esa economía propia. I had a question regarding uh, how the culture relates to uh, how our idea of culture relates to the economy and where culture fits in the economy. Y básicamente es porque estaba reflexionando si nosotros mismos no caemos en las prácticas o en las reglas que ha establecido el sistema capitalista de consumir y consumir y consumir y olvidarnos nuestra responsabilidad que tenemos para frenar eso, ¿no? Y... Basically, I was reflecting on how the rules that are established affect our consumption and how um, we're programmed to to consume and consume and consume without having any major responsibility. I'm just thinking about the difficult 
um, incoherences uh, of what this space. Y un ejemplo ha sido, por ejemplo, que hemos estado comiendo mucho y los materiales donde han servido nuestra comida son materiales que van a contaminar el medio ambiente. Like, for example, we've been eating a lot and the materials that we're using to eat are materials that are going to contaminate the environment. En dos días aquí yo creo que ha salido una tonelada de materiales que, que son contaminantes y que aunque estemos hablando aquí de justicia social, de justicia ambiental, nosotros mismos los que hemos estado aquí estamos contribuyendo a esa injusticia ambiental. I think that in the two days that we've been here, uh, I mean, I think we might have produced one or two tons of waste. <laughs> and uh, we could talk about the justice uh, amongst the communities and culture, but we still haven't, we still kind of haven't adjusted to justice on the environmental level. Yo he ido a las habitaciones donde estamos y no tenemos que dejar la bombilla prendida todo el día. Y sin embargo, he estado prendido todo el día y no pensamos en que. Hubo un río que destruyeron para poder poner energía para que llegue a este lugar. And we've been leaving our rooms, for example, with the light on all day, mm. and we haven't been thinking about that there was a river that had to be destroyed so that we could produce power with the light on all day. Entonces creo que sí, eh, la cultura del consumismo impuesta por el sistema capitalista está en nosotros todavía, en la psiqui de nosotros y creo que es parte de lo que tenemos que trabajar para poder cambiar. And I think that the culture itself and the capitalism is still within us and within our psyche and that's kind of what we have to work to fight against. Thank you very much. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, I have been to some few conferences where people have passed out bamboo, knives, forks, and spoons that people keep with them the entire time rather than having a bunch of plastic that's used once and then thrown away. Um, or where people have plates that are washed. I've even been to meetings where those of us who ate off the plate were called upon to wash our own plate. And we're capable of doing that. I just, I think that in the future, we should look to include more of those practices for exactly the reason that you're, you're saying. Uh, that that culture, the throwaway culture, is one that, again, is valued because under capitalism, the more you throw away, the more you get a chance to produce. And you you make it, you make money, you throw it away, you make money, you make it some more, you make money. So capitalism finds a way to make a bunch of money, and they aren't caring anything at all about the children yet to be born, or even the processes by which we need to engage to get rid of um, of, of the waste that we are consuming and using up. So I very much agree with what you're saying and think in the future we should try to work hard at correcting some of those practices. I thank you for that. I'd like to say something about the conversation around gender and labor because as a woman I think that we need to have a and so then I buy disposable plates because I'm exhausted by the amount of energy it took to get 50 people together to have a community meeting about something and it's often the same people that are often you know, female identified that we organize the meeting, we get the people to the meeting, we're taking care of the kids during the meeting and then we're exhausted so I'm using a paper plate because I can't do a bunch of the dishes at the end of the night and so I think that that like gender equity and like a broader sense of that responsibility would help us be more consistent with practices. En mi, en mi comunidad lo que hacemos cuando hacemos este evento, entendiendo que las mujeres que están cocinando están gastando mucha energía y como esto es una construcción colectiva, lo que hacemos es que nosotros hacemos un, un aporte de un poquito de energía lavando su plato y, y ahí estamos ayudando al medio ambiente. O yo estaba pensando en... Yo estaba pensando en si, en si hay un, alguien que puede pensar en, en crear unos platos biodegradables que no terminen en el ambiente. 
So in the, in the community spaces like these, when where we do events, uh, sometimes the women mostly do all the cooking. And what helps in our case is that we use a little bit of energy from ourselves. People they clean their own plates and the things that they consume, and that ends up helping the environment. I think even coming up with something like a biodegradable plate. I want to say something about the two points about culture and uh, media communication. I wanted to say thanks to our uh, sister here who mentioned this topic about media and communication and the kind of education, educational effect that that has on, on, on all of us and the way that we may not be taking that into consideration and who is behind or in charge of uh, those kind of uh, media tools. Okay, tú, para continuar yo con ese trabajo te, tuve que hacer de decisiones en mi vida acerca de cómo eh, manejar mis recursos económicos y, y mi ingreso económico. So, for me to be able to continue in this work uh, that I'm involved in, I had to make some decisions about how I was going to manage my own uh, resources of, of time uh, and energy and, and what I do, of course. Okay, de venir de un ingreso uh, de, de vender mi labor 90 horas a la semana, lo he reducido a trabajar 25 horas a la semana en, en trabajo comunitario y um, apoyarme de la sostenibilidad en mi casa como eh, cocinar para mi familia en lugar de salir, uh, pasar de un carro de 8 cilindros a uno de 4. So, for example, I went from working 90 hours a week to only working 25 hours a week uh, for community community uh, work and then I support myself uh, by doing more sustainable practices uh, in how I, I manage the affairs in our household you know, with the cooking and, and cleaning uh, and I change you know, from an eight cylinder to a four cylinder car and things like that. Pero sigo lidiando todos los días con las uh, decisiones que hago en cuanto a la transformación de mi propia familia, de mi comunidad y de qué tanto contamino o no contamino y cuál es mi propósito en este trabajo. But I still uh, have a difficulty with this issue uh, on a daily basis, you know, trying to take into consideration uh, you know, what the right balance is uh, between work and productivity and uh, how much work, uh, I'm contaminating and polluting. Uh, with the things that we do to support our family and to do the uh, community work that we're involved in. So, a veces tengo que escoger entre contaminar y tener uh, y criar a mis hijos con amor, porque quizás no estoy contaminando, pero estoy desquitando toda esa energía que toma de mí, eh, recortar todos los gastos de mi casa, eh, organizar a 20, 30 personas que están en un proceso muy difícil eh, y que va a ser un proceso muy largo. Uh, so sometimes I have to make these difficult decisions about whether I'm going to be a polluter or whether I'm going to uh, do everything I can do to take care of my children with the love that they deserve. Uh, and I have to think, well, am I going to cut back on my household expenses uh, or make these other difficult uh, decisions? Bueno, entonces hasta este momento me considero uh, que estoy desarrollándome uh, como radical, muy radical y marxista, y eso ha traído consecuencias a mi a mi existir. And at this moment, I feel like I have become more radical, more uh, radical in terms of my thinking, Marxist type thinking, and I feel like that this has uh, affected the way that I am uh, going about the basic uh, patterns in my existence. Yo creo que es una resistencia constante, tanto como um, vamos del principio de los medios de comunicación, la apropiación de quién, so, recobrando mis valores eh, como persona mestiza indígena o lo que quiera decir eso para mí, uh, con camino o no con camino. So I think it's like a constant battle then because getting back to the role of the media and how they influence us and then what my values are that I want to uh, continue to emphasize in my life as a person of uh, Mestiza uh, indigenous background that 
means also in my uh, form of thinking at this point that I don't want to be involved in such you know, contaminating pollution type activities. Y solo que estamos en la cuna de la, esta es la lucha más difícil porque el contexto de los Estados Unidos es la cuna del capitalismo. Entonces, uh, so I think this is the most difficult part of our, our struggle because we're like here in the cradle of capitalism here in the United States, so it's, it's a constant battle. In the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. I had a couple more seconds I was going to try to fight through. Yeah, you know, everybody's talking about media. Media is owned by six families. Of course. It's called the Illuminati, now called the New World Order. And the things that you're experiencing, this is pre planned. So what you are fighting is a situation that it's not only uh, where you're isolated and you're alone and a lot of other things, but what you're doing here today is you're trying to become a cooperative. And very simply, as you join the cooperatives, you start working together, bypass the system, simply create the system within your own communities. You'll be a lot happier. Turn off the television, turn off the newspapers. They're good for trash, bird cage runners, and we lost, most of it is all lies. You know, there's nothing going on that we can't correct by the folks that are in this room. When I look back in history, I look at Germany. I lost a lot of people in the Holocaust. My, family, my last name is Cohn. I'm not Jewish by choice, but the bottom line is my family is. And the thing about it is, is that was done by 7% of the German people. It had nothing to do with the mass, mass population. And what's happening to you and everybody else in this country, you're all getting shafted. And what you got to do is what you're doing right here, learn how not to get shafted, and learn how to work together cooperatively, no anger, nobody's angry at anybody, forget everything in the past, don't worry about anything in the present, look to your future and start building from where you're at and what you got. That's it. Let me go through these last few things that, I, that, that, are, that are here, and then, then we can wrap it up for a wider discussion. Um, there's a section here on the right hand at the bottom, like what must be produced. And obviously people have to be produced, food has to be produced, clothing, shelter, fuel and energy has to be produced, infrastructure has to be produced. We have gotten used to the infrastructure that is available to us, and quite frankly it's become financially a uh, really, really large segment of the economy. There was a time, a hundred years ago, if you were to think about, well, what's the total internet infrastructure worth? It was zero a <laughs> hundred years ago. Um, but it isn't now. 250, 300 years ago, if you were to ask what the interstate highway system would work, there would have been zero, because there wasn't one. So we, as we develop and live in a society, end up creating infrastructure to become more and more dependent on. And some of these can be large sectors of, of finance. So I know one of the things that there's some people thinking about is rural broadband, which has to do with how do we get the, the infrastructure in the rural areas, much like before there was a thing of trying to figure out how you can get electricity in the rural areas, and it came with the development of the uh, rural electric cooperatives. So part of what this whole purpose of this is, is for us to think about in a really, really broad way, what is the economic thing that communities do and it's a closed loop. This thing down at the bottom, regenerating, closing the loop, where you know you got dead bodies and fuel ash and energy entropy and poop. That's got to be, that's got to be cycled back around so that it, it ha or else it just piles up. For instance, one of the weirdest things we do is we bury people on valuable real estate, mm -hmm. so that you know for every grave it takes up a certain amount of space, and you know we will run out of space like that at some point. So, I mean, we, we have to think about kind of long-term how stuff is. So, this was my effort to get some people kind of primed to think about what kind of business activities are you interested in? Are you interested in infrastructure stuff, rule making, tool making, banking, finance, food? Uh, five minutes, right? Three? Five. Five, okay. Yeah. People. Uh, are, are you interested? You know, all of these things are viable economic activities. One of the things you have to remember is that some of these are things that people themselves are willing to pay for. Some of these are things that people are used to someone else paying for. Like people don't in this country typically pay for their own sewage disposal. But you might. And I can imagine that that, that could be something in a, in a rural area where there is no other sewage disposal that you would actually have to pay for it. But in urban yeah, and, and, and sometimes I think people are paying for their own sewage disposal. Um, so all of these things are economic things 
that sometimes people will pay for. Some of us are used to other people always paying for. In particular, this thing on the left column, philanthropy, we think somehow rich people are supposed to make available us the money that we can use to get rid of a world dominated by rich people. <laughs> a number of them will only play at participating in that and will love to suck you up into a cycle where you're running on a treadmill trying to get that next grant and the next grant and the next grant. And the next thing you know, you are more grant oriented than you are getting stuff done oriented because we got we to gotta live, we got to continue to exist. That's another grant. And I will assure you that before there were any grants, people built social justice movements. Yes. And one of the challenges I raised to some people in philanthropy is, do you think that there really wouldn't be a social justice movement where rich people didn't pay for it? And it's like once they think about it, it's like, oh, yeah. The problem is that it wouldn't be very nice that I would think that, that part of the purpose of philanthropy is what you call make it easy on yourself. So, uh, if people, so this is this is what I I have as an introductory thing. I'm going to be doing a thing along with Kyla, Kayla, Kayla, where we're going to be talking to people about their ideas, their business ideas. My guess is that most of your business ideas will fit somewhere on this page. Mm -hmm. They actually are reflecting something that 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 you can think of as it relates to this, and it's useful too sometimes because you can think about what the total value of this is in terms of a community being able to exist in a healthy way and consequently how it is that you could be compensated for it if that's something you need. Because again, we're talking about sustainable business ideas that don't require an ongoing infusion of money from the very rich people that set up the corrupt, corrupt system that we are currently living in. Mm -hmm. Capital to what end? In other words, when we talk about the end of capitalism, no, I'm, at, I'm asking the question is I feel like co-ops beg the question when you said capital. When did I say capital? Trying to no, well, oh, what I'm saying is, is that you said you gave the equation that, you know, there was money and capital and then money. Money, commodity, money. Money, commodity, money. And so right. we just keep doing money to this no end. And so that money is profit and surplus. So it's really money and profit and surplus. To what end? No, there is, that's the whole point of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's never an end. That's the whole insanity of it. If there is no end, it doesn't need an end because you can always make more money. But you can always increment a number. And that's all it is is a number. And it will exhaust the whole globe. <laughs> and following its own internal logic because it has no chance. But, what I'm, but that's what I'm saying. With, cat, with cooperatives, we are proposing or interjecting in it and, and meaning how we use our no. surplus. Is we're talking about, no, we're talking about meeting people's needs. That's why when the discussion came up the other day, are co-ops about making money or are they about something else? I would argue co-ops are not just about making money. Money is a tool yeah. to meet our needs. So the needs we have are these things. So if this was all non-monetized and all of this was satisfied, I wouldn't care about it. Never saw another penny.